We're going to be in, in uh, Luke chapter 23. What we've been doing uh, for the last, well, this series, we've been doing uh, uh, what is it, you know, the disciple, what does a disciple look like from the book of Luke? And we've, uh, we've talked about it and talked about what a disciple does, but my question to you this morning is, do you want to be one? Do you want to be one? Do you want to be a part of the family of God? And my question to you would be, is uh, if you died today, now, right now, or on the way home, do you know without a doubt you'd go to heaven? And I'm not really talking to those of you who say, oh, yeah, absolutely. I can look around this room and know most of you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking to you that don't, can say that. They could say, you know what, maybe not. I'm not sure. I had a, a guy in jail one time told me, he said, do you believe you're going to heaven? And I said, well, I hope so. I kind of think so. I'm trying to do the right thing. And he said, looked me right in the face. He said, well, if you don't know, how in the world are you going to tell us how to know? He was right. I wasn't sure. And I needed to be sure. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says, I write these things to you that you might know that you have eternal life. It wasn't a guess. People in the, in the New Testament, they knew. They knew what it took, and they knew what, con what conversion and transformation looked like. They knew what it looked like. They, they could tell. Many of them, like we talked about in class this morning, many of them came from pagan, idolatrous places, and, they, and it, was, it was obvious when they, when they converted. It was obvious when they transformed their lives. It was obvious. And so, like I've told you before from this pulpit and from my class, if you say you're a disciple and you're not willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus every single second of every single day, don't call yourself one, because you aren't one. I'm trying to tell you this morning, what, did, what does it look like from a, just a snippet of Scripture that most of the time we just look over? We don't even really look at it. We see it. We know it. We know what that text says. But when I had this text to do, when I had this chapter, I said, what am I going to do with this chapter? And then I found this, and I said, you know what? I need to remind them that Christians, disciples, are paradise bound. We're bound for paradise. That was a promise. And it's a promise that's reiterated in this text for this criminal. And, but we're not going to get there yet. We got some other stuff to do first. We got some things we need to talk about. Jesus comes to Jerusalem riding on a donkey as a king. And all the accolades and all the, all the shouts of hallelujah. And he is going to go out as a criminal in just a very short period of time. He is going to, uh, uh, he is going to, uh, uh, he's going to talk to us and tell us all through Scripture how he wants us to understand that he is bringing in a new way. He's going to bring us an opportunity to have a relationship with the Father. He is going to give us an opportunity to go to heaven. He is going to ha give us an opportunity to spend eternity with the, with, with the Father and Him and the rest of us together. That's the opportunity He's going to give us. That's what He's going to tell us. Mary and Martha knew it. When He went to raise Lazarus from the dead, they said, you know, we know, we know that He's going to live again in the resurrection. They knew about a resurrection. They knew. You know, they knew that David knew. David knew way back then. He knew. When his son died, the first son died because of his infidelity and his, and his sinfulness, he was going to lose four sons, and he lost the first one, the baby. And you know what he says? He says, I know that baby can't come to me, but I can go to him. He knew that there was something coming afterwards. Job writes us in the book of Job. He said, oh, I wish that my words were written down because I know that my Redeemer lives. These guys knew. Jesus came and told us, I am the way, the resurrection, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't care what you do. I don't care who you worship. I don't care what idol you, sit, you kneel in front of. I don't care what the ism is on the back of your name or back of the name of the one you follow. The only way you're going to go to heaven, period, is Jesus. There isn't any other way. No other way. You can do whatever you want to do. You can say whatever you want to say. You can walk out of this building tonight. Those of you who said, well, I'm not sure and absolutely know I wouldn't go to heaven, then you can go and try to find every, any way you want to go, anywhere you want to go, any ism you want to follow. There are even places out there that are teaching Satanism now. 
You can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't change the fact of what the truth is. The truth is the only way to heaven is through Jesus himself. It's the only way. You know, when you, uh, when you look at this chapter, and there's a couple of things that I picked out of this chapter that, that what's going on. He comes, he rides in as a king. Okay, they are shouting accolades and, you know, there are religions that that have palm Sundays because they were throwing palm leaves and stuff. And that's where they get that from. And Jesus rides in and then starts to unravel everything that they stand for. And and if you look in, and if you have your we didn't write them down, we didn't put them up there. But if, if you look at chapter 23 and you look at at just verse two, it says, you know, when when they take him before Pilate. All right. He's already cleaned up the temple. He's already had his Passover meal. He's already done all this stuff. And chapter 23 is where he's standing before Pilate. And here's the accusations against him. He is he is uh, uh, he is subverting our nation in verse two. He's subverting our nation. It means he's undermining our nation of people. This is the leadership. This is the, this is the, the throngs that shouted, shouted hallelujah to him. Now, I'm trying to put you in what's the, what does the dynamic look like in their, in their time frame in that day? Okay? We can't get there. Our minds a lot of times won't go there. I want you to think about the dynamic of your day today and tomorrow and next week and last week. What was your day like? What was your week like? What was your month like? What was it like? Did you live as a disciple? Did you shout hallelujahs to the king or did you look at him as a criminal and relegate him to the back burner in your life because you were afraid somebody was going to see him? What did you do? These folks have stepped up and decided he doesn't need to live anymore. He is a criminal. And so in verse 2, they say he is subverting our nation. And in verse 5, he says, he said, he is that his, he stirs up the people all over Judea. He's stirring up the people. Like a, he's stirring them up, making them you know, agitated. You know, I guess they might have thought that when he walked into the temple and started cleaning house with a whip. Probably would have thought that. But then in verse 14, he tells them, he said, they say in front of Pilate, he is inciting them to rebellion. They were re- the people should have rebelled. They should have rebelled against, against the false notions and the false teachers, and they should have rebelled against Satan. They should have rebelled from, from their own lives from following sin. What they should have, that's what he was trying to get them to see. What they didn't understand, that Jesus was the Passover lamb. He was going to the, he was, he was allowing them to take him to slaughter. When Peter cuts off Malchus's ear in the garden, right before this happens, right before he puts Malchus's ear back on and he tells Peter, don't you know I could call legions of angels? This has to be. It's been prophesied since the beginning. It has to be. This man had to die so that you and I could live. Without him dying, we can't live. There is no way for us to go to heaven. And God wants every one of us to be right. He wants every one of us to come to repentance. He wants every one of us to spend eternity with him in the paradise he calls heaven. That's what he wants. You know, my goal this morning is just to introduce you to what are the possibilities, all right? How am I going to pull this off in my life? And we're going to look at a couple of criminals. That's what we're going to look at and see what they did. Because I think, I think there's a formula here for salvation in these guys. If you just look at it and see. I'm going to, now, I'm, I've been accused before that I like to read between the lines too much. Okay, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think. And what maybe have happened, because I'm going to put myself on that cross next to that guy, next to Jesus, and think, what would I have been thinking? What would I have been saying? What might have been happening to my life the days, weeks, months before? What could have happened? And just say, is it a possibility? Okay? I want you to look at verse 39. We're going to put this up. We do have this up. I want you to look at, at, at verse uh, uh, chapter, three, chapter 23, and we're going to start in verse 39. One of the criminals, now, now they, they, they haul him out. He drags this, this beam around. They get Simon of Cyrene to, to help carry this thing. And, they, and he drags. Now, remember, uh, he's been, beating, been beaten before this. Most guys died from the beating. Most people didn't make it to the cross. The Romans were sadistic. They knew how to beat a man. And they knew how to keep him alive. And they knew how to kill him. 
You know, when he's, when he's hanging on the cross and they stick a spear in his, in his side, they, they know how to do this. When they break legs, they know why they're doing that. They're doing that so the guy can't breathe. So he can't push up and breathe. They know what they're doing. This was a sadistic, it was an evil, it was gruesome. And I wish that I could tell you that exactly what it must have looked like and what it must have smelled like. This was death. People were dying here. Three men hanging on three crosses. And these three men are going to die today. And the, and the crowd that shouted hit for him, wanted him to be a king, they're the ones that put him there. They're the ones that, that, that went to Pilate and said, we got it. Pilate doesn't want to do it. But he does it anyway. If you look at verse 39, he says, one of the criminals who hung there, now they hang these got three guys, Jesus in the middle, one on each side. Okay? The, you know, we call it an old, old rugged cross. We sing that song, an old rugged cross. You know, it was probably a pole sticking out of the ground with an with a attachment where they lifted him up and set this beam on top of it. That's probably what he carried, you know. But I'm not here to talk to you in details about the crucifixion. It was happening, okay? I'm assuming that you all believed it happened. I'm assuming that you all believed that Jesus was dying there for a reason, okay? I'm assuming that, that, uh, that maybe you just never looked at what it meant to you. What was, the, what, was the, what was it to you? Why you? Was he saying anything to you in this text? And what, is it, what, did, he, what did I need to look at here? He says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for what we are getting, for what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. I'm going to stop right there. There's a couple of things here I want us to look at. There's two criminals here. And I think something you and I can learn, and you better learn this. You better recognize what has put you on the cross. Okay? You better recognize what put Jesus on the cross. Your sin. Not mine, yours. He's hanging on your cross, okay? You should be hanging in the middle of them two criminals. Not him. It is... And this, this criminal rebukes the other guy. Maybe it's his compatriot. I don't know. Maybe it's his accomplice. I don't know. But what he's doing here, he says, we deserve what we're getting. We've done this. He's just acknowledged. He's acknowledged to, to Jesus and to himself, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. Let me tell you something, folks. If you don't walk out of this place this morning and recognize that you have a problem, you're never going to come to Jesus. Not ever. You'll do something, but you're not ever going to come to Jesus unless you recognize that you're lost. He can't help you unless you admit that you're lost. This guy says he did. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, 38, Peter is preaching the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost. And he's preaching to the same people that were hollering these things at him. He's an insurrectionist. He's subverting our nation. He's inciting people to to insurrection. Same people. And Peter gets up and looks at him and says, you killed the only son of God. You did it. And it says in verse 37, they were cut to the heart. You know what happened to them? You know what happened? They recognized in that moment that they were sinners and that they'd done the unspeakable. And they say, is there anything we can do? Anything. We'll get there in a minute. When, when Paul is writing the book of Romans, and he writes a text in Romans chapter 7. And you know what he says in Romans chapter 7? The things I want to do, I cannot do. The things I don't want to do are the things I do. And he gets to the end of that dialogue and he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? You know what, Rome, what Paul was telling to the, to the church he was writing to in Rome? I was a sinner, and I was lost. And on that road to Damascus, guess who showed up? The guy on the middle cross showed up. Paul didn't believe in him. Paul was there. Paul, Paul was, was, was in that time frame. He was in that dynamic. He knew about this Jesus. He recognized him as soon as he appeared to him. Recognized him as soon as he appeared. He said, what do I need to do? 
And, and a few days later, Ananias comes to him and tells him what he needs to do. And you know what he starts doing? Goes and does it. Goes and does it. He realized he was lost. He's writing that, that, that text in, Rome, in Romans to let us know, hey, you know, you're a sinner. When he writes the, the last verse and then the first verse of chapter 8, in chapter 8 it says, and he says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This criminal realized he's a sinner. Look at what he says again. Look at what he tells his, his, his buddy. He said, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. He said, I have every, they have every right to hang me here and butcher me because I am lost and I'm a sinner and I'm no good. That's what he says. Doesn't he say that? Don't you see that? That's what he says. And I don't think you can even come to Christ unless you do that first. You won't come to him. I've studied with a lot of people. I've studied with thousands of people in the jail. And you know what I realized? Until they realized that there was something that they needed in their life, they weren't going to come to him at all. And then look at what he says next. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now, here's where I'm going to stretch it a little bit, okay? He doesn't say this is the king, this is the Lord. He doesn't say that this is Jesus, the Messiah. He doesn't say that, does he? Does he? Doesn't say it, does he? We know that there's a Roman centurion there, and not in here, but in Matthew, he says, this truly was the Son of God as he watches this guy die. There were other people there that recognized something was different. I want to, I want to suggest to you, and, and for, what if this guy had met Jesus before? You think? He lived in the time frame, didn't he? He's hanging on a cross next to him. You think he ever met him before? Maybe he heard him preach sometime. Maybe he knew somebody that heard him preach sometime. Maybe there was something going on, because he recognizes right away, this, guy's not, this guy ain't not like us. This guy ain't done anything wrong. This guy's innocent. Well, I'm going to take this to the point. If you don't recognize that Jesus is Lord and King, if you don't recognize that he's Lord and King, and he can save your life, guess what's not going to happen? Your life ain't going to get saved. Because you can't come to church enough. You can't say enough prayers. You can't give enough money. You can't. You can't do enough things to get where God has to save you. But he promises to save us because of his son. Because of the Lord and kingship that he has and him being the Messiah. And this guy recognized something's different about this guy. This guy don't deserve to be here. And I just wonder, because I think like that, I just wonder if maybe something happened before in his life. Did he know this guy before? Had he talked to him before? Maybe, maybe he saw some miracle before. It didn't change him then. But look at what he's going to say. Look at what he says. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <laughs> now what has he said? I know who you are. You are Lord and King. Do you know who Jesus is? Remember, I'm talking to those of you who asked that question. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? If the answer is, I don't know. I hope so. Maybe so. And I'm going to ask you, do you know him? Have you recognized that he is the Messiah? That only through him can you be saved? And if the answer is, no, I really haven't, then maybe you're right. Maybe you shouldn't be overconfident. You know, when he says, he said when he recognized Jesus was special, when he recognized he's the only one he can save him. He knows that Jesus is not going to get him off that cross. How he knows, I don't know. That's not what he asked for, does it? He doesn't ask for that. You know, you know what people do a lot of times when they pray today? I got this problem and I got that problem and oh, I got this problem. And can you help this person? And they never pray, God, I'm lost. Can you help me? And can you find me? And can you save me? I remember praying that. I remember on my knees praying, Father, begging, please save my life because I am lost and I don't know what to do. And if you don't ever get to that point where you realize you're a sinner, that Jesus is the only one that can help, and you call out to him to save you, it's probably not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. So my suggestion to you is listen to this, this criminal because he seems to have it one up on you. 
And look at what Jesus tells him. I tell you, look at what he says. Then he said, Jesus, remember when you come into the kingdom. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Disciples are paradise bound. He promised it to this guy. He's promised that. He promised it his whole existence. All the time he was preaching that he was going to prepare a place for us. Did he not say that? I go to prepare. If it was not so, I'd have told you. What did, what did Peter, you remember when, I think it's in John, I believe, and, and uh, uh, Jesus starts teaching, and he teaches them that you have to eat my body and drink my blood. If you don't do that, you can't have a part of me. Well, they started leaving. All these followers, they're leaving. And they, they, and they're, they said, you know, I ain't chewing on this guy. I'm not doing that. I'm not drinking his blood. That's for sure. I'm not doing that. They started, got the reputation that they were practicing cannibalism. You know, and he looks around, Jesus looks up, and I can just see him looking up, and he looks up around and he says, what about you guys? What are y'all going to do? He's got his 12 still standing there. And Peter looks at him and he says, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You are the righteous one, the holy one of God. You have the words of life. You're the holy one. We got no place to go. He recognized who Jesus was. He recognized that Jesus could save him. He recognized that Jesus could take him to heaven. You know, if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 16, and this one I'm going to read to you because this isn't that important. We didn't write it down, and I figured it out last night that I wanted to do this text, and, and I, told, I told Ann it was about 10 o'clock. I said, Ann, I was going to call you and tell you that I had extra scriptures. You know, I said, I'm not going to do that to her. I'll just read it. Uh, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Let me see where it's at. Yeah, it's in it's in uh, in verse sixteen. Simon Peter answered, "You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." He said, "Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by my flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven.' And I tell you, you are Peter." And he goes on talking about him being the rock. He said, "You are Peter." He said, "Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, only my Father in heaven." You know, when you look at at that, Jesus is the only one that can save. He has to become the Messiah. He has to become the one you say, you look at and say, I know I can't save myself. Only you can save me. I need you to save me, Father. And if you walk out of this place and you don't ever get to that point, then you probably aren't going to ever get to that point. If you don't, at some point, recognize I'm a sinner, I'm lost. Jesus can save me and I'm, Jesus help me. I need, your, I need you. I need you today. Please. I'm going to finish back where we started. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2. Can you pull that back up for me? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You know what it means to be victorious? You know, what, you know what it means? What do you think it means to be victorious? That I have overcome, with Jesus' help, I've overcome this world. He's the winner. There isn't anybody else. The criminal knew it. Pilate knew it. That centurion, he knew it. I wonder, this is stretching a little bit again, I wonder, is he the same centurion in Acts chapter 10? You know what happens in Acts chapter 10? A Roman centurion prays out, cries out to God, and God sends Peter to him. Peter don't want to go. And he sends Peter to him, and he's, him and his whole family are baptized <clears throat> into Christ. I wonder if it was the same guy. I don't know. <clears throat> if you're going to be victorious, coming to church ain't going to get you there. Serving Christ will. It's the only way. We're going to have me, I'm going to be back there, or I may be up front. Cole's going to be up here leading singing. He'll be up here in case. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a time for you to say, okay, or at least go home. Take this home and say, I'm going to read this again because I want to see really what this criminal has to say to me. I need to be, I need to remember that Jesus is the only way. I need to remember I'm lost without him. 
and cry out, Jesus, can you save my life? And you know what he promises? He will. If you need us this morning, if you, if you say, I'm, I don't know what to do. I'd love to sit down and study with you. Cole would love to sit down and study with you. We've got to study tomorrow with a member that's sitting here this morning that we're going to go to his house and study with him tomorrow morning. I can't wait to get there. It's going to be fun. We'd love to study with you. We'd love to baptize you. We'd love to have you come and say, God, I want to put my Lord on. I want to be saved. I want to be in a right relationship with God because I'm lost and I don't want to be lost anymore. Whatever your need is, you come while we stand and sing.